Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Facebook Live Lunch and Learn with the Center for African American Health. So as we enter the month of June, it appears that we're hopefully turning a corner in the fight against COVID-19. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, cases and deaths are at their lowest levels in nearly a year. This positive update is met with a call to action to individuals who've delayed medical care during the quarantine to resume scheduling routine appointments. Health facilities have protocols in place to limit the spread of COVID-19, as well as telehealth services available to anybody who's concerned about making an office visit. In fact, I recently took myself and my sons to our first dental visit um, since pre-pandemic. Please check with your healthcare provider for routine screenings and um, help with managing any chronic conditions. And as we wait for more people to join, I'll do an introduction and tell you a little bit more about us. My name is Dieter Johnson, and I'm the CEO and Executive Director for the Center for African American Health. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with our work, we have been in the Denver community for more than 24 years, and our focus is the health and well being of African Americans. As we move through today's session, please feel free to type your questions in the comment area and we'll address them as time permits. On the heels of the CDC announcement easing mask wearing guidance for fully vaccinated individuals, our Governor Polis issued a similar response in a news conference to Colorado residents. The current message states that fully vaccinated people no longer need to wear a mask in most settings and individuals who aren't vac vaccinated are highly encouraged to do so. The motivation behind lifting the statewide mask requirement was to encourage the community at large to get vaccinated. However, many individuals remain hesitant to move forward. Today, we're invited, we've, we've invited a panel of experts to address some of the key issues and concerns that continue to contribute to vaccine hesitancy in our community. I'm so excited to be joined by Louis Shackelford, the External Relations Project Manager with the COVID-19 Prevention Network at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. We also have two medical professionals from Colorado who you may recognize from um, our previous Black Health Summit and their work in the community, Dr. Terry Richardson and a CA Health, a health Board member, Dr. Oswaldo Granardo. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Yes. Thank you for inviting us. So we'll start with Lewis. Lewis, your colleague, Dr. Stefan Wallace, helped us kick off the year in January with a similar Q&A segment related to the vaccine. We're thrilled to have you continue this conversation today. Um, we'll likely be inviting you guys back in a few more months. Please tell the audience more about your role with the COVID-19 Prevention Network. Thank you, Deidre. So the COVID-19 Prevention Network is basically the body of government entities that have come together to shepherd the COVID-19 vaccine trials, especially the phase three portion, the final portion uh, that leads towards approval a vaccine, a uh, COVID-19 vaccine trials in the United States. So we shepherded all of the COVID-19 vaccines that you've heard of um, with the exception of Pfizer's study. Um, they did that study in-house, their phase three studies, but the Moderna, the AstraZeneca, the Johnson & Johnson, um, and more to come, by the way. Um, those vaccine studies were shepherded by my organization, the COVID-19 Prevention Network. And so under the COVID-19 Prevention Network, we have uh, research networks like, like the one that I work for, the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, who were called upon because of our expertise in developing an HIV vaccine to lend our, our hand in helping to develop COVID-19 vaccines. Um, but you also have government in entities uh, like BARDA, like the CDC, like um, the NIH, all of those kind of come under the banner of the COVID-19 Prevention Network. And that's what's allowed us to have such an efficient process in developing 
um, these COVID-19 vaccine studies and making sure um, our expertise in external relations and in the in the HIV vaccine trials network has been in making sure the trials have been diverse and represents all of the populations, especially those that are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 throughout the United States. And so we develop expert panelists from the very beginning of these phase three studies that are devoted to different groups like African Americans, Latinx folks, Native folks, um, older adults, um, to make sure that the trials are inclusive and welcoming to people of all different backgrounds, especially those, as I said, who have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. So during your outreach and education efforts, were you surprised about anything you were seeing and hearing as it relates to our community and the COVID-19 vaccine? Um, I think there's always things that come up that surprise me. <laughs> there's always um, things that you hear. Um, and, you know, one of the last things I've heard was uh, how drinking coffee before you get vaccinated is supposed to lead you to having less uh, symptoms. That was something that came up. Um, and there's all sorts of things that come up. I mean, that's just one example, but as time has gone on, I've just heard so many different things. So, I mean, it, it's, for me, it's just a constant reminder that we need to continue to do these educa this educational work and that the job never really stops, even though we're at different, much different point in the pandemic than we were initially, we're in a different place in the pandemic than we were two months ago. Um, there's always a need for more education and misinformation and disinformation really never sleeps and never stops. And so as long as that's the case, there's always gonna be a need for us to continue to push factual information from trusted sources about COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccines to our communities in particular. So where do you think public health, official, public health officials are missing the mark when it comes to messaging and informing community about the vaccine? That's a good question. Um, I think a lot of times the mark gets missed when we don't rely on communities to lead the process of education and outreach. And so when you have people who are not trusted voices in a community, like say African-American communities, when you have people coming from outside those communities and trying to do this educational work or trying to prescribe solutions to problems that they may see or they may perceive, um, that's when we run into the most issues. Um, and it tends to be that the solution is almost always going into the community, having conversations and let community members lead the process in solving their own issues or, or developing messaging in this case for um, developing the messaging that really impacts the people in their community. What should the Black community know regarding the clinical trial process and research for the vaccine that might help alleviate some of their concerns? They should know that people like them, that look like them, that care about them, that have the same concerns, have the same skepticism about these vaccines and the process in developing these vaccines were a part of the trials from the very beginning and made sure that their voices were heard and that they had that their concerns were met throughout every part of this process, that they weren't left out, that this wasn't something that came um, from people beyond them or didn't care about their communities, that, you know, people like myself, people like you, like you said, Dr. Stefan Wallace, um, Michelle Andrasic, um, Rachel Osaka, who's a part of our expert panel, and so many more that I can't even begin to name here, were there from the very beginning of these phase three trials, making sure that black people were heard, that our concerns were met, that these trials were made in an inclusive way. And that, and they were thinking not just about the trials at that time, but they were thinking 
long term about what happens when these vaccines were approved and making sure that when they were approved, that when they were offered to African Americans, that there was weight behind these trials being uh, inclusive and reflective of what um, happens in the Black body when they receive them. Thank you. So Colorado is currently in our phase two of vaccine distribution, which is the general public, um, 12 and older for the Pfizer vaccine, 18 and older for Moderna and Johnson and Johnson. Despite increased availability, the pace of new vaccinations has dramatically slowed down. And we've been um, seeing this at events across the state. Dr. Oz, why do you think there's been such a decline in vaccinations? I think the people who were really interested in getting the vaccines uh, had the ability and the availability to actually get it. And so even those who are on the fence around the access piece in terms of getting it, can I get it? Is it going to be easy for me to get it? With that being alleviated, um, it's now really those people who are, um, from what I'm seeing from community perspective and or um, individual patient perspective, it's, it's still a variety of issues that are decreasing the number of people who really want to get it. And it's that misinformation that Lewis was talking about, um, that is still present. People talking about magnets in people's arms, um, and, that's, and that's a sign that there are microchips in there. You know, there are tons of fallacies that continue to perpetuate to come up that we've got to, as Lewis said, really continually come back. There's still mistrust. Um, and so that, that will always play a role in, in the work that we do in trying to improve the trust that communities have. And then um, really looking at data. You know, I've had a lot of thoughtful people say, I'm still waiting on more data because I'd like to get more data and make sure that I'm still comfortable with actually getting the vaccine. So very legitimate question um, and concern that people have and in wanting to wait for more data as more data comes out, it's showing that this vaccine and these vaccines that we're using for COVID-19 are fantastic in terms of um, the number of people they're helping, how we're decreasing the rates of transmission, how we're decreasing the numbers of people who are getting sick, and the numbers at this point in time really support that this vaccine is doing a fantastic job with helping our country um, move through this pandemic. Your, your audio was a little fuzzy, but we could hear you. So I don't know if you changed something in your setting. Oh, no, yeah. I didn't. Is, it, is it all right now? No. Is it better now? No, it was perfect before we started. Oh, shoot. I don't know what happened. Yeah. I didn't, uh... It's like a Darth Vader ish echo. Oh, jeez. Um, let me. Let me try to move. Is that any better? Not better? No, it's about the same. Um, maybe I'll go off and try to... Um... Maybe you can try to mute and then come back on, yeah. Is that any better? Nothing. So, how about that? Nothing. Jeez. Ah, I'm really sorry about this. Oh, no worries. So, um, Eric, I know you're in the background. Should he leave and come back, do you think? Or is it the connection? Yeah, Dr. Ozzy, um, you could try next to your speaker button. Um, I apologize, your microphone button here on Zoom, there's a little upward um, hat, a little arrow that points up where you can click on under select a microphone. There should be an option where you can pick between microphone and maybe same as system. You could try to name back to, you know, from that and then back to what you're on now to see if maybe it changes something. If okay, you, how, is, oh. is that better? Perfect. 
I said something brilliant too. No, I'm joking. <laughs> so got a few more questions for you. Um, we've heard some individuals believe that they may not need to get vac vaccinated if they've already had COVID before. Is that true? Uh, we'd still like for people to get vaccinated. Those people who, who have had the, um, the actual infection, um, we know that they have likely created antibodies. Um, we don't have good data right now to suggest that those antibodies give the same level of protection as um, our vaccines are giving. And so once we get more information on that, um, hopefully we'll have better guidance around that. But for now, certainly the thought process is with the great data we have around um, our vaccines, and again, the rates of transmission, as well as those who are actually um, getting ill from this, we really want to make sure that those people get vaccinated. So people who have had the infection will have some level of um, antibodies, but we just don't have enough data to suggest that, yes, forget it, you don't need it. Um, we still really want to make sure that people get it because that in, can only enhance your natural protection that you get when you get that vaccine, if, even if you've had um, that infection. Thank you. So what, what advice do you have for individuals living in a household that's divided on whether or not to get vaccinated? Yeah, that is, that's a great question because there are certainly those households who have strong feelings either way and certainly with individuals um, either way. I think a lot of this is having discussions, one about family values and what does your family value in terms of health, in terms of science, in terms of um, the information and where you're getting it. And can you make sure that um, you are getting the information from solid, reputable sources that you all trust? Um, getting people on that same page can sometimes be difficult, but can lead to then hopefully better discussions around um, getting the vaccine or not. And so it's, it's being supportive of people's decisions. So it's, it's not trying to denigrate or demean or make anyone feel bad that they're not wanting to get it. And, and certainly we know that protecting everyone in the house with the majority of the people getting the vaccine is much better than um, having one person get the vaccine versus and no other family members get it. So the more people in a household that can get the vaccine, the more protected that family will be. And certainly we want to make sure that we're protecting as many people as possible. So hard discussions to have, but certainly um, it's trying to, for those, for my interest as a medical provider, it's trying to make those conversations into one about how can we protect ourselves in the best possible way? What kind of data and what kind of information are we looking at? And then, and then making a, a decision to, to protect our family in the best way we think possible. Thank you. So what should people with underlying or pre-existing conditions, such as cancer, diabetes, and heart disease, what should they know about getting the vaccine? Yeah, those people who have underlying conditions that are chronic and um, similar to cancer or diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, they really need to make sure they understand that by getting the vaccine, they are at the highest risk of having issues from COVID-19, and that's serious, hospital, serious illness from it, hospitalizations and or death, and knowing that the vaccine can pre prevent all of those. And so getting that simple vaccine for those high-risk health conditions for people who have those is incredibly important for them to prioritize for themselves. Um, we want to make sure that you're doing everything you can um, to improve those chronic conditions, if possible, um, through diet, through exercise, through medications. But certainly this is the best way to keep yourself healthy from the pandemic. And as we see groups getting immunized, the virus is still here. And with the virus, then that virus is attacking those people who have not gotten the vaccine. And if you're in that vulnerable position, if you're in that 
high risk population, that is then targeting that virus may be targeting you. And, and we worry, seriously worry about the conditions that you can have, um, the effects that that virus would have on you and, and certainly the hospitalizations that we've seen so many people go through. And so if you've received the vaccine, you're still at risk of contracting COVID-19. Yes, but it's incredibly less than if you didn't get the vaccine. So I actually have had some patients who um, got the vaccine and then actually did get COVID thereafter, but their symptoms were incredibly less than we would have anticipated given um, who they were around and what their health condition was. So thank God that they actually got the vaccine so that they could really minimize um, the effects of that virus on them. So yes, but there are certainly so many people also who have gotten the vaccine and been around or exposed to COVID who actually haven't gotten it. And so um, we know that in terms of protecting you, it's really the best thing we can do for you. Yeah, I even had a conversation with a family member explaining, you know, unlike other vaccinations, this does, they're not shooting you up with COVID. So this is very different. But how do you, um, and it's not a silver bullet, but anything that protects from hospitalization, death, that works for me. Dr. Richardson, what information can you share with women who may be concerned about the vaccine affecting fertility? And that's a good question. Believe it or not, early on when I was doing presentations, there was actually a question put about men having fertility issues as well. But that is misinformation. Women do not have to worry about being uh, infertile due to the vaccine. There's really no scientific evidence that you will have fertility issues if you get the vaccine. So I know people are looking for some reasons why they shouldn't get the vaccine, but this is not one. That's clearly misinformation. No problems. And so what about people who have autoimmune conditions? Some of them may be concerned about getting the vaccine. What should you know, they do with their doctor? I'm sorry. Yeah, and so, I mean, always connect with your doctor first because they know your case the best, but they are advising that even people with autoimmune diseases should go ahead and get the COVID vaccine. And autoimmune diseases are things like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis that people may have heard about. And, uh, Sometimes it depends on what you're being treated for that autoimmune disease that may uh, decrease your, your immunity, but they do feel you should get the COVID vaccine. Um, it's possible that your immune response won't be as robust as someone who doesn't have that disease, but you still will be rendered protected to some degree, but they just don't know how well protected you will be. So we still encourage people to practice some of the other public health measures like washing your hands and wearing a mask if you're around people that may not have been vaccinated, but definitely go ahead and get the vaccine. So a lot of individuals who've received the vaccine have reported various side effects. Um, and it's interesting because there was so much going into it emotionally, even for me, because you heard everything and then I didn't really have any. <laughs> 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 what are things people should be aware of before and after getting vaccinated? You know, beforehand, they should know that getting vaccinated is good for all the reasons that people have mentioned, that it will prevent you from dying and preventing you from uh, being hospitalized from COVID. Although some people may get it, you're not going to have a severe case. So that's definitely a reason to get the vaccine. But you may get some sort of side effect. The most minor thing that I think most people talk about is getting pain in the arm. And one provider said, it's a shot, there's a needle, so you could get a little pain. So, <laughs> so I always have to laugh about that because uh, one of the most common things that people complain about is pain. Um, and it can last uh, a day or two on the first shot. It can last hours. Um, there could be redness. Some people have described having some lymph node enlargement on the side where they got the vaccine. 
Uh, and it's possible for people to get rashes of some sorts. And then there's more, uh, more unusual things that people may get, because I think a lot of people have heard about the few cases of the women that got the Johnson and Johnson and ended up with a special clotting in um, the venous sinus thrombosis clotting in the upper facial area. Uh, but usually it's, it's more minor, just uh, pain or maybe a little redness and, and usually lasts no longer than a few days. But whether, and one thing I would add too is whether or not you're gonna have side effects is really an individual thing. You have some people that say, hey, I got dizzy, I got fevers, I felt like I had COVID. And you have other people that said nothing much happened. So it is an individual experience, but there's a whole host of things. You do not get COVID from the vaccine. I wanna make that clear, but sometimes you feel sick enough where you feel like, hey, did I really get it? But you do not get COVID from the vaccine. What advice do you have um, to offer those who might be concerned about an allergic reaction to the vaccine? And I'm gonna say what I always say, check with your doctor first. But I also talk about for the Pfizer and the Moderna, which have been out there the longest, they have very few ingredients that people are allergic to. I mean, basically you have sugar water, salt water, one of them has a little vinegar, and then you have the polyethylene glycol, which is like the fatty uh, covering that allows the, the vaccine, I mean, the, the mRNA to go into the body. That may be the one ingredient that people may be allergic to but there aren't uh, a lot of people that are even allergic to that. But if you have any concerns, you should check with your doctor. They're saying people with food allergies, including like peanut butter or shellfish, you're still able to get these vaccines. There's none of those types of uh, products in the vaccine. So you should be fine. But if you're concerned, always check with your, your doctor. If you've ever had a reaction to polyethylene glycol, you definitely need to talk with your doctor about that. And you also, if you're concerned, we usually have people wait for 15 minutes after getting the shot, but if you're just concerned that, hey, I think I might have a, a more issues, then just have them monitor you for 30 minutes. But most people should be fine. So before we open it up for questions, I wanna go around and ask each of you to share your personal experience getting the vaccine. We'll start with you, Dr. Richardson. Okay, great. And I will say that I actually wrote a little blog about my experience getting the vaccine because most of my friends know I'm usually like a wait and see person when it comes to vaccines. And in fact, I must say that for other vaccines, I've always told my patients, hey, wait about a year before you get it. But on this one, I, you know, with all the deaths and Black people being more, uh, being disproportionately impacted, I said, I'm going to get this vaccine early. But I did have a bit of trepidation. But I got my shot and really I had pain in my arm for about, well, maybe two days, two to three days on the first shot. On the second shot, I said, well, they say you may get sicker on the second shot when you're a little older. So I was prepping. I was like, maybe I'll get a free day off of work. I'm going to be so sick. I'm going to be dizzy. I'm going to be, you know, so sick. I have to be in bed. So at midnight, I'm thinking, you know, I go to bed late all the time, but at midnight, I'm like, uh, I'm feeling pretty good. My arm isn't even sore. I said, well, maybe I'm going to wake up sick in the morning. Well, I woke up that morning and I was feeling fine. So no day off at work. So it was great, but I, I did have a lot of fear. I wrote about it. I shared my uh, first shot, both my second and first shot on Facebook, because I wanted people to know that I really think this is important for our community to do this. I know there's the trust issues with what's happened in the past, but this is a different day and we need to get this vaccine. So I want to show that, hey, Miss Wait and See got it early and I'm still fine. I'm still cooking. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. And um, what about you, Lewis? So in my role outside of the COVID-19 Prevention Network, I'm a member of the Air Force Reserve. I'm actually a medic in the Air Force Reserve um, in a unit that services the base that I, I work on. And one of the things we do is we do the immunizations for uh, members on base. So I got vaccinated, not through uh, the COVID-19 Prevention Network, but actually through the Air Force Reserve. 
And so it was a nice little kind of collision of worlds or, or meeting of my of the worlds that I live in, uh, the military. And so it was it was a surreal experience to in my day job be working with researchers who are developing this vaccine and help it come into fruition and then have go into the military and um, have it be delivered to me there. Um, so that was a really great experience for me personally. Um, in terms of actually receiving the vaccine, the first dose, I felt little to nothing. I think when I sat down, I was laying down and I felt like the slightest of slightest nausea, which just went away as soon as I jumped up and, you know, started walking around and took a shower. So I wasn't really worried about side effects after that. On my second dose though, I, that's when, as in people normally, it tends to happen with people, they uh, tend to experience uh, more significant side effects, if any, on the second dose. And so for me, that was a little bit more fatigue, felt a little bit fatigue, a little bit of kind of a blah feeling um, for a few hours during the day after. But like I said, it only lasted for I want to say maybe three hours or so. I just felt like I want to go lay down for a little bit. Um, and then I was fine. So for me, the process wasn't too abnormal. I mean, I normally, when I get a vaccination, my, my arm is sore for a few days. So that wasn't anything abnormal to me. Um, and yeah, other than the fatigue, it wasn't, it wasn't a bad experience for me. Thank you. I drive. Yeah, for myself, I think the first shots I got, I had a sore arm just at that site. I could still use my arm and my hand for, um, I had that pain probably there for a couple of days, then it went away. And then with the second shot, similarly to Lewis, I had a, it was probably 16 hours after I got my shot, I'd gotten it in the evening. And then really the next day had a four hour period where I just started having chills. Um, didn't feel bad, but just unusual chills. Felt really cold, couldn't get warm. And it was a nice, beautiful day. Um, didn't realize what was going on, that it was actually due to likely due to the shot. And then literally um, within a four hour time frame, it just stopped. And then I was fine. And had slightly a sore arm for, again, another couple of days. And then that was it. So um, I, I will say, you know, I was, I was nervous um, upon getting the first shot and um, worried about uh, what it was going to do to me. Um, could I really trust everything that was going on? And so, you know, going through that process of sitting there, getting ready for the shot, I, I did have some, some apprehension and, and, and a little worry about what was going on, but certainly when I got it, you know, all my fears were alleviated. And so I was, I was obviously excited to get it. Um, but I think there's, there's a psychological component and then a physical component that you're thinking about as not only you're getting the shot, but then afterwards and trying to hopefully stay healthy, drinking lots of fluids and, um, and then really following your doctor's orders on, on how to help with some stuff. Thank you. So we've got several questions that have come in. So the first one, I don't look like many of the community members I provide information to, but I do care. How can I make sure that sincerity is felt as I attempt to connect to those in the black and brown communities? I'm a public information officer for a health district that is made up of four counties and one city of about 375,000 people. I can take a crack at this one. Um, I think it's it's important to understand, you know, trying to find the best way to say this. It's important to understand when you're the voice that's needed and when maybe you're not. And so if you are going out and you're doing this work and you find that the community members that you're trying to engage don't respond well to you or maybe you don't 
come off as the person to them that would that they could receive this from as a trusted voice so they don't recognize as a trusted voice then i would take that as a sign that maybe i need to find trusted voices who i can partner with or you know maybe i need to do some more relationship building um, to find folks in the community who are advocating and doing this work and maybe support them in the efforts that they're already doing in the community um, but I think it's great that we have community members that are trying to do the work in creating these educational initiatives. I think those are some of the are some of the best initiatives that we've seen thus far, and I think they're going to be the initiatives that we need moving forward as vaccinations kind of slow and these public these like big public vaccination sites are closed down more and more throughout the country, we're going to be relying more on these grassroots efforts to get people vaccinated who um, are left in the community, who are, you know, what people don't perceive anymore as the low hanging fruit, people who may be a little bit tougher to get to and may take more time to um, think about getting vaccinated, we're going to need community members. Um, in grassroots efforts to go out there and do that work. So I would tell that person to continue that work, to you know follow your heart and your passion to help your community, but also recognize as you're moving forward, if you're not the right voice, then making sure that you find the right voices or find people who are already in the community doing the work and supporting them as well. Yeah, I, I think that's perfect. And in looking at the information that you give out, certainly it's got to be trusted information. So whether or not it's websites with um, those race concordant or language concordant, same um, providers giving that or experts, having that information can hopefully build some trust. And you having a relationship over a long-term period will hopefully then allow you to then become a trusted provider um, in that community, even if you are of a different race or ethnicity. And so it's, it's really what we've seen in this pandemic is that those trusted voices, those trusted um, leaders um, have been entrenched in the communities for years and decades. And when new people try to introduce different ideas and or ways to go about educating a community, those have failed and, and, and not gone as well as planned. And it's because of that, that trust. And so in doing the work that you're doing, I, you know, I'd certainly um, applaud you and, and want you to continue doing it because that time and effort spent will hopefully then translate later on to a more trusted relationship, especially if you're bringing really relevant information to that community. And if I can just add that, you know, there's also the cultural lens to add to these things. And, and sometimes it is a language, sometimes it's a, a race or ethnicity, but sometimes it can just be cultural. And that could take place even within communities. So I'm a black man, but it doesn't mean that I'm the voice to go out and speak to every black person and be in, it doesn't mean I'm a trusted voice to every black person. So, you know, as a cisgender heterosexual, um, married black man, I may not be the trusted voice to go out to say um, a trans community of, of black people and, or non-binary uh, community of black people and talk to them. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. And so understanding where your voice fits into this cultural references for people as well. And, but understanding that that doesn't mean that you can't go out and support communities that are different from you. And I think the two gentlemen have said it all, but I would just simply say that trust is earned. And so don't, don't just go out when we've got a pandemic, uh, develop those connections, everyday connections, and then the trust will be there. In our community, the black community, you don't have to be black. If you're, you can be trusted if you've shown that you care, if you can look people in the eye, shake their hands, you know, and that's what we want. We don't want people not looking at us in the eye. We don't mind a, a friendly touch on the shoulder, but that's after we trust you. 
If you're just coming out for a purpose, hey, we need you to do this or we need you to do that, that's not going to work. You have to earn the trust. And that does take years at times. It depends on your personality. You know, sometimes you can make that immediate connect. They're like, oh, she's cool. But at other times, you're going to have to work on that connection. And just remember that trust is earned. It's not just handed to you on a platter. It's earned. Thank you so much. Another question. This is a good one. Um, I've been having these discussions with family members. How can you get those who prefer to use natural products to get the van? Oh, how can you get those who prefer to use natural products to get the vaccine, vitamins, oils, et cetera, to try and prevent, they're using vitamins, oils, et cetera, to try, to, to try and prevent, as well as those who are concerned with long-term side effects, like what might happen to us five, 10 years down the road. I guess I'll take that one first, but certainly anyone else could. Because I get that question a lot too, is why can't I just use uh, natural products? And I say, there's nothing wrong with using natural products. Go ahead and keep using those. You want to build your uh, natural immunity as much as possible. But none of those measures are felt to be as effective or robust as the vaccine. So I say you work together. I mean, I once recently was called a holistic doctor. I never considered myself as such, but I do know that my views on some of these things are a little bit different than most internal medicine doctors that I train with who believe that the only way is to do it one way or another, the way that Western medicine has taught us. But I've learned over the years that you can support your immune system with some of the, the natural products out there, but I definitely wouldn't use that alone in trying to vi uh, fight this vicious virus. You need the vaccine to, to maximize the immunity, to make sure you're getting enough of the neutralizing antibodies that will knock this vicious virus out. So that's my thought on that. Continue to do the natural immunity, but take what we have. This technology is great and it can help keep you out of the hospital, keep you from dying from COVID-19. Yeah, and I, I'd echo that. So by taking those natural supplements and vitamins, as Dr. Richardson was saying, it primes the immune response to be as robust and big as possible and effective. But that vaccine itself says, now we can create the antibodies to actually target um, the COVID virus when it comes into us. And so having that primed and ready immune response with and coupled with the um, vaccine can really then empower you to um, have a great response if you were to get the vaccine and, be pre and, and truly prevent against infection. That long-term consequence of the vaccine and the, um, is, is a good, you know, it, it's a good question. And so, you know, certainly good for us to ask what are the long-term consequences for us in understanding how that these vaccines work, especially the mRNA vaccines. We know that from 30 years of using this, that we haven't seen any long-term issues um, with these types of, with this technology. And it doesn't get into the DNA. It doesn't cause disruptions later on. And so, as we look at this from a long-term perspective, that argument is, is valid, but we know from um, prior use and we know from the science that we have, there's not going to be likely any issues. We're not seeing any, um, and, and we will take the science that we used previously and apply it here and, and likely say we're not gonna have any issues going forward. So a lot of this is, is looking at what we've done previously and saying, we're probably gonna be all right and not have any issues. Thank you. Well said by you both. Um, all I add is that, you know, vaccine is one um, of many precautions that we have instituted against COVID-19. It's a major, it's probably the most significant, it is the most significant precaution that we've developed so far. But if you're not going to take the vaccine, then I would encourage that person to, you know, continue to use the other precautions that we know that are effective in limiting the spread. 
uh, in effect of this virus. So if you're going to be boosting your immune system, make sure that you're also practicing social distancing and wearing a mask and and especially indoors and in tight spaces where in, in crowds, you know, make sure that you're not just doing these holistic things inside your body, but make sure that you are taking care of and taking precautions outside of your body to limit your risk of COVID-19. Um, so that's one thing I would, I would say as well, just to add to everything else that's been said and to the people who are engaging with folks that are, that are not ready to take a vaccine, I would also just remind you to be an example. You know, we know from surveys that one of the greatest things that you could do for somebody who's vaccinated to help them decide to get vaccinated is to be an example, is to give them a, a real world example in their circle, in their vicinity. Um, and that tends to help even more than a lot of the public health campaigns that we see. Um, so be an example to, to folks who may not be vaccinated yet or, you know, have some concerns about being vaccinated and just be open to talking and listening. Thank you. That is so true. I found out from um, one of my aunts that she even used me as an example when someone didn't want her to get vaccinated. But, you know, Deidre did and she's fine. She's still here. So you're right about how when it's close to home we can serve as an example. Um, related to that, what would you like to tell people about COVID-19 prevention who are and feel too concerned with the many other health and social issues that are impacting them? Get vaccinated so you don't have to worry about it. I mean, <laughs> um, I'm a person who, who likes simplicity. I, you know, I like to, I'm a, a big kind of task oriented person. I like to tick boxes. And once I tick that box, it means that that task is complete. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, and I can feel good and kind of revel in the accomplishment of doing something to progress myself forward. Um, that's a really big motivator for me as I go about my work day to day. And so if you feel like there are many more pressing concerns in the world than COVID-19, which, you know, considering your situation, considering everything going on in the world, I, I may not be able to argue against that. Um, you could get vaccinated and this will be one less concern. You know, it'll be one less concern for you in terms of how you move about the world and your safety and your health. Um, and it also be one less concern towards your community. If you are really uh, about community betterment, if you are about community health and well-being, well, one of the best things concerning COVID-19 that you can do for your community is get yourself vaccinated. So you are a dead end point for this, for this virus this virus wants to spread throughout your community and the virus and the vaccines that we develop make you a dead end it makes you a stopping point and not a spreading point so i would say get vaccinated so you can worry about other things very good and i was thinking um deidre that you led at the well the latter part of what you were saying in your introduction was to have people get back to taking care of some of their uh, chronic health concerns or prevention measures. And I, you know, in listening to that question, I was thinking about that fact that people have neglected their routine prevention measures because of COVID and of course having to be at home. And so it is really time to kind of get back to taking care of ourselves and trying to make sure we're as healthy as possible. You also had mentioned the fact like diseases being more at risk for COVID and, you know, how does that impact them getting vaccine? And I agree with Lewis, get your vaccine. If you have chronic conditions, you're going to be at more at risk to get significant uh, conditions when, if you get infected with this virus. And um, included in chronic disease is obesity. Uh, people that are obese, if they do get COVID, can have um, worse outcomes. And so it is, I, I'm an internal medicine person. I believe in prevention. I think this is a time where now you can start working. If you do have chronic diseases, start working on how am I gonna get those improved? But frankly, it's not gonna happen overnight. This vaccine takes a few seconds. 
is going to take a few years if your uh, chronic diseases aren't in control. It's going to take a few years to work on that. So I agree is protect yourself as much as you can. Otherwise, you're just going to be at home, you know, looking at yourself in the mirror. Exactly. Incredibly agree. So as we look at social determinants of health and all the things that can affect your health, as Dr. Richardson said, this is one quick way to prevent against getting a devastating, truly devastating infection. There was a Denver Post article, I think today that came out about a gentleman who spent two months in the ICU, a black guy. So it's, it's thinking about how can you prevent something that could cause you to have such an incredible, um, impactful, negative experience health-wise, economic-wise, family-wise, relationship-wise, and it's a simple, simple thing to do. So as, as everyone was saying, the others can take time in terms of prevention, improving chronic conditions, um, looking at other social determinants of health and changing those, but this is an easy one to, to fix and do um, from the start. Any suggestions on how to start productive conversations in the household? or how to help each other prevent COVID and support each other from the pandemic's effects when it comes to economic, mental, social, et cetera. So related, but a little broader. Yeah, there's some really good websites that have black docs talking about what is going on in the pandemic and what is going on with the vaccines, how they were created, how they were made, how they can protect. And so to me, it's trying to find good, reputable sources of information um, with people who you may trust um, that, that you can access and watch together and then have a discussion about. You know, I, it, it's, I think it's very hard to argue against someone um, when you're not sharing an experience or data together. And so if you're saying, well, I saw this on Facebook or I saw this here, um, those are hard discussions to have. And then understanding some of the emotional responses that people will have, if you can get information from a good spot that is, again, reputable and coming from hopefully someone that you trust or that seems very trustworthy in our community, hopefully then you can have a better experience and then trying to talk about some of the issues around um, some of the finer points that you may be arguing about or having issues between family members. And if I could just add, you know, one of the things that we do at the CoVPN and one of my, my role in external relations is hosting conversations um, and developing uh, spaces where we can have conversations, especially Black people, Latinx folks, uh, Native folks. And so we have a series called the COVID in Black, for example, um, where it's Black people of all different uh, backgrounds um, coming together and talking about their experience, not just vaccines and vaccine research, but also just in the pandemic in general. Um, there's a great website called uh, blackdoctor.org. One of our partners that we work with very often, they host conversations on almost a daily basis with different folks throughout the African diaspora talking about a wide range of topics in COVID-19, health, and, and all sorts of things in, in terms of wellness of Black people. Um, so if you want to look up those resources, it can be a good starting place, back, blackdoctor.org, and you can find uh, the COVID, COVPN's information on our um, Facebook page or on our YouTube page, um, which is Prevent COVID 19. I um, appreciate you sharing that. Go ahead. And, and I was going to say, I, I start like this in any conversation. I'm not really there to convince people to get a shot, to get COVID 19 shot. Uh, we're there to have a conversation, and I try to share my expertise. I once had a woman call me recently and said, We're getting ready to have a family Zoom, 
and I want you to come on. I didn't know, I don't even know if I even knew this lady, but somehow she knew me and I guess she trusted me. So she said, and this, this was a family reunion type of Zoom. Like people were from all over the United States and they're like, we're gonna bring this black doctor on and she's gonna tell us what she knows. And I mean, some of these questions that they had were just like tremendous. And, you know, I started out by saying, it's like, I'm here to answer your questions, to share with you. I'm not here to tell you, get the shot. Because some people earlier on were concerned or upset with me because I wouldn't just come out on Facebook and say, you need to get the shot. And I said, I'm not their mother. I'm not their doctor. So I'm trying to give people information because we do have the free choice in America. Um, I like what Kizmikia Corbett says that getting vaccinated with COVID-19 is community service. So I share that information and I share the concerns that people have. I, I, I come right out and say, here's what the black community is concerned about with this vaccine. Is, are we gonna get a chip in there? You know, are we being getting picked, et cetera. So you address all those concerns but in the end, it's up to the person. But I think that don't go into any conversation saying we're going to, you know, by the time this is over, everyone's going to get a shot. People may need to move at their own pace. But I still find it fascinating that after all this time and on Facebook and CNN and all the information on the news, what's been written about COVID, people still have a lack of enough knowledge to make a decision sometimes to get this shot. So if we can continue like we're doing today to share with people, give them the information. We all try to stay really up to date on all the information and then let people make a conscious decision. I think it's the right one if you get it, but if you don't get it, you know, I'm not gonna put you to pastor or anything like that. So that's, that's the way I, I like to approach it. Just have a conversation and be open. Thank you. I so agree. And I was going to say, Lewis, I stole from you a phrase when we first met when you were talking about, you know, there's so much misinformation. How can we clear the haze? So if you ever see me in a recording, I didn't attribute, but thank you for that. Because it was so perfect. Because if ever there was a group of people that had good reason to have concerns, it's us, but we also can't be in our own way. And so, like you say, Dr. Terry, we don't tell anybody you must do this, but I will say, if you want access, we've got you. Access and information, but you have to make your own decisions. So um, one more question. With many dollars and initiatives being directed to COVID-19 and health equity, do you have any suggestions on how community members can advocate for better policy outcomes during COVID-19 and beyond? I'm gonna be brief and say, we have to push the systems to lead with the equity lens in everything that we do. That's what we need to be advocating for. If we look, about, look at the testing, the vaccine distribution, there was no equity lens. After the fact, people are scrambling. Some groups sprinted to the front of the line, and then now we have the marathon of the other people behind. You know, It's like a marathon getting people in. So we need to push to the lead in everything that we do with the equity lens. Racism is a public health crisis and we need to be leading with the equity lens and we're gonna make some uh, great strides. That leading with equity lens, I've used in several presentations and always quote Dr. Richardson, because it's true. When, when people don't have a focus on that from the beginning, we as a, community fall behind. And so it's working with your legislatures. So there are, there's a black caucus who is really integrally involved with um, working on these issues. Um, and so it's looking at how can you talk to them? How can you talk to your own um, legislative person um, who's representing you to discuss some of these issues? There are lots of organizations who have specific advocacy work towards these, um, really these community issues around um, social determinants of health, around racism, discrimination, um, and, and really advocating on our behalf around these health issues, especially around the pandemic. So it's looking those up and we can hopefully give you some ideas later on about who they are, but there's, there's lots. And so it's trying to then use your energy to either work with those organizations who are 
using that advocacy on our behalf to help them or working with legislators who are doing the same, whether or not that's a Black caucus or the Latinx caucus, um, those people are really trying to push forward ways to help our communities in these efforts um, that, that may be opposed to some of the other efforts that are happening at, in other parts of the uh, legislature here in Colorado. Nothing to add. Okay. Believe in the power and in, in, in believe in the power of your presence and your voice. Thank you, and you know, hold folks accountable because it's one thing. Everybody's talking about health equity, but it's one thing about getting to the finish line. And when a policy is passed, that's only the first step. We've got to make sure it's implemented and things are happening that were intended. So. This has been wonderful. I wanna thank all of you today. I know you're extremely busy and we really appreciate you taking this time out and joining us for this important and timely conversation. As was mentioned in this pandemic, things are changing constantly. It feels like something new every week or every couple of weeks. So thank you for all that you do for communities um, and for joining us today. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, this video will be available along with other information on the center's website at caahealth.org. And I will just add in partnership with Nine Health, the center's offering vaccinations twice a month. So come on down. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you everyone. Thank Take you. Care. Good luck. Be safe. <laughs>